Hey YouTube, Network Waste Kid here, and we are back with another video to take a look at the Cisco CCIE practice labs. For those that have watched part one, you will know that from last week we kind of went through what the CCIE practice labs is all about, the FAQs, and uh, we got to a point where we actually tried to access one of the schedule labs that I had. Uh, ready but couldn't do so because there was a, a, an issue so in this video we're going to take a look at one of the schedule labs that I've got um, available how to connect to that and um, yeah kind of what the lab entails at least the one that I have scheduled for me today as well um, shout out to University of Bradford for sending me uh, my alumni t-shirt for finishing my cybersecurity master's degree appreciate that shout out to anyone from university of bradford that's watching this now um <clears throat> so we're on the ccie practice labs uh, page here and i've actually been spending some time before i actually started this uh, video for you guys i've actually been spending some time exploring the lab um because as you know you get a four hour slot so i really wanted to um, explore it before actually doing the video and uh, you know that kind of puts me in a better position to kind of give you some tips and um, share with you what I've experienced uh, in in this so far so before your exam uh, well your practice lab treat it as an exam before your practice lab um, you should receive an email to tell you that your lab is scheduled and it has your credentials and, and passwords and stuff in there as well so that looks like this so that's uh, what that looks like and you'll use that really to access your your lab here um, this is the actual lab when we get to it but before we actually do that, um, to actually get to your lab, uh, we need to select the um, scheduled practice lab. And then before we can press start practice, we need to connect to a VPN with the instructions provided in the email. So to do that, we need to open AnyConnect and then we connect to, you can see here I've been connected now for nearly two hours. Um, we connect to practicelabs.cisco.com uh, with the username and password that's been provided to you. Once you connect to that, uh, you should be able to connect successfully. As we saw last week, for those that have watched part one, you saw that I had a few issues around that and couldn't connect. This week it's fine. So once you've done that, uh, we should be able to then start practice lab. So. Um, when I clicked on this the first time round, I get this uh, error, you know, the page cannot be found. And um, I don't know if this is because of the way my practice lab has been set up for me to demonstrate this. Um, however, this is an issue, if not, if, if everyone does kind of receive this, this is an issue that, you know, we need to feedback to the guys at Cisco so that we can sort this. Um, so do let me know in the comment section if you also find that you have this issue when you press uh, start practice lab. If you do, it's not a showstopper because all you have to do really is remove the uh, leading fields in the URL so that you have labs.practice.cisco.com and if you press enter on that then you can enter your username again and log into your actual lab environment. Once you've done that, you will be brought to a page like this. So what this is showing is the um, full CCIE security practice lab environment that's been uh, set up for uh, people to to practice with. So yeah this is the lab and then what we've got is we've got there's a few icons here that we can actually click on and these are the devices that are available to us in our uh, practice lab um, today so 
we can see that there's a few routers that we can access here and so on and so forth so we'll take a look at that after we also have a few tabs here on the right hand side so we've got tasks resources guidelines devices and then save and exit so if we start with tasks so when we open tasks we have uh, a task list for our practice lab that we scheduled so we've got a number of tasks here and I must say reading through the tasks and uh, actually as I say I managed to play around with this a little bit before doing the video one thing that I've noticed is that there's no kind of you don't kind of it doesn't seem like you go from task one to task six and then voila you're complete and you, you you know validate that everything's correct sort of thing it seems like tasks one through to six are uh, different tasks as a whole where you can kind of mess about with um, you know the different um, you know different configurations and configuring the uh, elements uh, slightly differently and I believe this is so that you can kind of get used to the configurations uh, break things fix things learn new things um, and also validate and troubleshoot um, as you kind of go along. So there ain't going to be any button that you press and it's going to say yes you've completed it successfully congratulations or no there's an issue. Um, you're not going to get that validation. You know this is just a an environment where you can learn the technologies more, learn the configurations and um, you know going through each of the tasks by the end of each task you should be able to um, validate that you can you can kind of do what it's asking um, in the task so say for instance here configure SSL VPN then configure port forwarding so you'd then test that configure any connect type v2 and then you could you know test from your remote worker configuring trustsec uh, dynamic mapping and uh, you know posture assessment so um, yeah you kind of just go through them tasks configure them there is not going to be any sort of um, configuration guide but in the real um, exam I do believe you get access to the Cisco docs so familiarize yourself with the Cisco documentation and how to navigate through that and get the configurations that you need there as well so as I say, just making that a little bit bigger. Um, so say for example, on config SSL VPN, you've got a task, uh, you've got some requirements in task one that you need to go through. Um, and it literally just gives you the bullet points. So you need to be able to know how to uh, configure uh, HA, essentially as these first two tasks. Um, you need to know how to configure OSPF with authentication. Uh, then you've got the uh, the requirement for the RSA key uh, and then you've got the VPN configurations uh, here as well and then you know that's pretty much it for task one that you're gonna have to be able to test and make sure that um, it's configured uh, correctly as well similarly for the next task again you've got a, a list of tasks here um, so this time the ASA 2 must be the primary unit uh, ASA 1 and 2 interfaces must be configured in a monitoring state so if you're following on from task 1 then that should already be done you just need to flip the um, the units from um, you know determining which ones are the, the primary in this one then you go from configuring OSPF to EIGRP so you see there there's kind of no follow on um, you then have to change from OSPF in task 1 to EIGRP in task 2 um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, that just means that there's a you know you, you, you're going to touch on a lot more configuration as opposed to trying to just going through um, the task list and getting everything completed because it wouldn't take four hours to to do. So I think this has been designed to um, try and give you an environment where you get hands on with the technologies but also get to configure each of the different elements as per the blueprint as well, which is which is really good. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the tasks. So if we click on resources, 
We then have the, the main topology here that we can see and if I just kind of make that bigger so you can see so we've got the main topology here uh, we've got a few highlighters here um, I've been playing around with these but I can't seem to get it working because it this just seems to move the uh, the actual page as opposed to to highlighting um, so I don't know if that's just me being stupid and doing it wrong um, but for those that have messed about with the labs or those that are gonna mess about with the labs let me know if you get that working and tell me what I've been doing wrong and if not then we can feed that back to Cisco um, to hopefully rectify um, there's also as well on, on some of these pages there's also a submit feedback about this item so if you experience any issues or there's something that's not quite right then do feed that back uh, feed that back using um, the, 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 the necessary and relevant methods or you can always comment in the video and um, I will try and feed back the information through my channels in, in Cisco to uh, to get that looked into you then have a scenario topology as well um, so this is the particular scenario that we're focusing on today so ours is the uh, VPN element as well uh, so you can see the focus here is on the ASAs, uh, configuring all that good stuff there. Uh, so this is our main focus right here for today. And then under tables we have uh, device access credentials. So these are the credentials for each of the devices. Uh, not necessarily all the devices that you're going to access today. Or in your uh, time frame for the lab that you're doing. We then have the out of band or the management network uh, addressing here and then we have the FQDNs for the lab environment as well. So we've got all the relevant information that we need. Uh, and these topologies might be useful, I mean if you've already got some sort of uh, lab environment and you want to try and recreate this um, then you know these, these topologies are also um, useful as well so let's leave that page for now and then we have guidelines so in the guidelines we can see here um, we've got eight, eight different points so so as well this scenario comes with a set of tasks that focuses on remote access VPN you have access to all devices within the main topology and you are free to run your own scenarios on the given setup um, so this says within the main topology now the main topology is the one here that we're seeing so this would assume that we have access to even though it's not part of the lab today we have access to the WSA um, the ASA and things like that I've not tested that so if we get time we can have a look at that um, but that would be good because that would mean if you kind of get through your tasks within the four hours for um, you know what you have um, bit set out to do then you know you can mess about with a few of stuff in, in the lab as well another promising bit here is is point two and this says that the practice lab delivery environment is identical to the CCIE CCD lab exam environment so this tells me that this environment is pretty much the same as what you're going to encounter in the real exam. Um, obviously, probably IP addresses and stuff are going to be changed, but um, yeah, for those that kind of are looking for something to go off or something to um, use before getting to the exam, I would now recommend you you know really take time to uh, try and access this it's only fifty dollars for four hours um, I don't think that's quite bad but you let me know in the comments whether you think fifty dollars is too much or if it's a good price um, yeah let me know but I think you know that if you do get access to all the devices um, and you do get an environment that is similar to the lab in real life or the, the lab that you're going to encounter on your exam then 
you know, it's, it's pretty much a no-brainer. It's worth trying to do as much as possible, get familiar with it before you actually go and sit your lab environment, uh, your, your lab exam, that is. We already know step three, which is just kind of telling us uh, what we're going through now, the different uh, tabs. And as I said here, solution or verification steps are not provided. So, you know, this is a practice lab. You are meant to use this to configure, to test, to troubleshoot, to get familiar with the technologies um, and to configure as per the steps or the tasks that are uh, set out. So it kind of gives you a free reign of an environment to you know get used to really. So um, you know that's why there's kind of no verification steps provided. However, if you have configured things the right way, then you should be able to uh, achieve the desired uh, goals of each of the tasks. Lab access is controlled by a timer uh, corresponding to the relevant time slot. Yep, so we, you get four hours, as I mentioned, in part one uh, for each of the labs. You can see I've got 54 minutes left because I've been playing around with this this morning and getting used to this myself before actually delivering this video um, so I could give you a better insight. Um, so I've only got 54 minutes left of this, so hopefully we'll get to see a little bit more of the lab as well before we uh, close off this video. Uh, there is a, uh, an ASCII and not to tamper with host names, passwords and OS images of the devices and I believe this is because you know other people are going to be using uh, these uh, lab environments as well and if you start to mess about with things like that then you're just going to um, delay the availability if you like of the um, the practice environment for others. So just do take that into uh, consideration. As I said, task level feedback can be provided at the task level and helps us in our continuous effort to improve our offer offerings. So as I said uh, and showed you earlier, you do have that little feedback button which you can provide that feedback if you see something that's not right, if something didn't quite work the way you expected it to work or if you were just having issues um, during your four hours. Feed that information back. Um, also, just feedback in general. You know, Let the guys at Cisco know how you found the environment, uh, if you found it useful, did you like it, any, any, any feedback will go a long way. As I said in part one, the practice labs are new from Cisco, so they're open to improving the experience for you guys. So the more you feedback, the more that the guys can act on the feedback and hopefully you know, continuously improve the delivery. And again, if you experience any issues that prevent you from operating the practice lab, please open a case at the specified URL. So I don't know if this is, uh, this is all well and good when you're actually in the practice lab, but I don't know if that URL is also covered in the FAQs. Uh, if not, it probably would be good if it is included in the FAQs. Uh, that's my personal feedback there because as we saw in part one when I had problems accessing um, the lab environment connected to the VPN, you know, I couldn't uh, proceed with the lab sort of thing. Luckily, working for Cisco, I have internal contacts where I reached out to, shout out to Matt for sorting that out and getting me to where I am today. Um, but, you know, not everybody works for Cisco and has internal contacts there. So, you know, It'd be good to include this link on the FAQs if it's not there already. Let's leave that. And then if we click on devices, then we have access to all the available devices in our scheduled session. So you can see we've got access to quite a few different. Uh, we've got the two ASAs, we've got the management PC, remote access worker, we've got two um, a number of routers got servers and supplicants and switches so we've got quite a few different um, devices that we've got access to there as well which is good 
and I'll leave that open because we'll come back to that. Um, and then lastly, you've got the save and exit where you could, you know, take a break, save and exit and come back to it sort of thing. I don't know if you save and exit and you reschedule the same practice lab. I'm not too sure whether you get the same configuration. So if anybody from the Cisco side can feed that back to me, that would be great. Um, I'm not too sure if that's actually covered elsewhere as well, um, but it'd be good to, good to know. So without further ado, which I'm sure many of you are wanting to look at, let's get into, let's open the task list. And then let's open the devices again. So if we go to ASA, as I said, some of it will already be configured because I've been playing around with this um, earlier on. So let's just make this a little bit bigger. So I'm on ASA 1 here. You, what happens is when you open the devices, you open them in, in, in different tabs here. Um, which is great, you don't have to keep opening multiple screens. You can also, um, there's different buttons here. So this one, let's just make this bigger so you can see. So you can type in commands to send to all devices. What's this settings? You can change the font size here. You can enlarge it so you've just got the uh, ASA config or you can keep it so you've got, you know, different, different tabs here. Um, one thing that should be uh, saying ASA one because I've already joined it to the uh, as a as a HA device. One thing um, I don't know why that's like that. Uh, going to make that bigger. Yeah, and you can open and close that as well. So one thing, uh, sorry, which I was going to say is that. Uh, when you're doing this, you, you will probably have multiple pop-ups open, so it's it's probably worth having you know two screens at least to you know move things about just so that everything don't get in your way and you're continuously uh, minimizing and and maximizing maximizing as you go along. So as I say, as you would do, you just go through you know starting from task one, you go through. Um, based on your knowledge and you know looking at documentation and whatever configuring these steps so this one says first and foremost the ASA must be primary when you first start off um, when you first start off the devices are not configured the interface um, IP addresses and stuff are configured but you know failover and stuff's not configured so you must configure that you can see I've kind of done that here um, then you need to do all the authentication stuff as well before OSPF can be joined in this particular task uh, sure. so you know this is this is configured now um, and so on and so forth. So you you do need to, as I said, the commands are not going to be given to you. So make use of the Cisco documentation. Get used to the Cisco documentation and navigating around that, and then work your way through. Um, you know each of these steps as well. So um, we've got forty five minutes left. So I think what I'll do is I'll pick up from where I left off if I can remember in in terms of configuration and I think we're actually configuring um, OSPF authentication between the devices so let me just check kind of where I was at just so you can kind of uh, before we finish this video you can kind of see um, you know a little bit of the configuration side as well and how I'd really go about making use of that that task uh, list that's given so if I just go to router one IP route. so we've got OSPF configured now and this is where I'm not going to do a lot of talking now because I'm going to try and focus and remember configurations and stuff like that. Um, 
but yeah, I've, I've configured OSPF authentication between um, router one now, which is down there, and uh, and the ASAs. So that's uh, that done. Um, so if I now, I did have. Let me just check. Uh, where's the remote worker? Yeah, I did have this open. And So what I'm doing right now is I'm just trying to uh, see whether I can get the remote worker to connect to the SSL VPN that's being configured. Um, one thing that I can point out is that if you click on the management PC here, you can actually configure um, ASDM. If you're familiar with ASDM or you want to work or prefer to work on ASDM for the ASAs, and then you can configure um, ASDM to, to use as well. You do need to configure it on the CLI to, to enable that first, but once done, you can access it from the management PC. Um, so what was I going to do? <coughs>
So, for some reason, that didn't save. So, I'm just going to enable this. Uh, <coughs> so, let's see if we've got the any connect images actually. I'm sure I saw them. Yeah, so they should be in there. So we can add the any connect images as well. Um, I think they're in lab folder. Let's do the ICE compliance web do fly package. This one here. Let's upload this one. Uh, okay, on that one. So, so far, um, <coughs> just to kind of give you a summary. The ASAs have been configured for failover. Um, ASA 1's acting as primary, ASA 2 secondary. Uh, interfaces have been configured in a monitoring state. OSPF authentication has been used uh, between, I'll just show you, so far only between root 1 down here and the ASAs. We do need to configure authentication for Route 3, Route 2, and Route 4 as well. And maybe Route 12, I think. And all the rest of them, I think. Um, the VPN session will be authenticated locally, as you can see there, AAA local. I also created a, another user um, to test that with. We created a banner and we also said that all DNS queries must be resolved through the VPN tunnel as well. So we're pretty much done with uh, with the task one element here. Um, so what I was doing now is I just had to reapply that with the image. And then once that's done, we can test on our remote worker again. Uh, so we've got to remote worker. I think that's the outside interface. Gig zero three. 10, 1, 12, We've got a route to it. What's the ASA saying? Um, so fifty fifty one one one. So that's why. So the roots not in the table. Have I added that in there actually? Uh, OSPF area zero. So I don't think I've added fifty one 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 zero into uh, root uh, OSPF one. Zero. Uh, area zero. 
obvious here once up there you should be able to see that yeah we can see that now so uh, let's just write mem Yeah, that from remote worker now let's try I don't think ping's enabled actually but let's try connect now yeah that's better <coughs> add an exception SSL VPN service uh, I think I created user 1 There you go, so now you can see that the uh, the banners displayed. So CCIE Practice Lab. And you can see the SSL uh, VPN um, here as well. Um, let's go to AnyConnect. So in terms of the task one, um, and with me doing some background configuration, you can see that um, pretty much all these tasks are done. So we, you know, that success criteria, um, let's just start any connect there. That success criteria for me, uh, as I said, there is no validation here from, from the Cisco side. Uh, the validation for me would be to, you know, first and foremost, make sure failover is configured, uh, make sure the monitoring uh, for the failover interfaces, uh, sorry, for the interfaces for uh, the failover are configured. I'd check the OSPF authentication, uh, which we, we can confirm because we've established that connectivity between uh, the ASA and with the router in this case we need to do the other routers but you know that's uh, at least we know our configuration is correct um, we authenticated locally using a local username you know we haven't gone off to ice or anything like that we saw the banner CCIE practice lab when we connected and DNS queries must be resolved through the VPN tunnel which uh, we can also test as well um, so now we need to we need to get any connect so maybe I should um, where's any connect Any connect client software installed as well. Uh, so group policy saying we're using default group policy.
I'm got no any connect client profiles we're not configured that under our split tunnel in that's where we sent all the DNS lookups through the tunnel to satisfy one of those requirements so let's go back to on the in fact let's close this and let's go to our any connect So yeah, our SSL VPN is set up and then we've got the Arc V2 element here. Uh, there's a few more different requirements here. It's configuring a pull. So let's have a look at this, see if we can do this one um, quickly. So ASA1 must be the primary unit it is. Uh, we've also got that done. Uh, we've also got that done. We've also got that done. The client at address pool must be okay. So let's configure the <coughs> uh, the address pool for the client and DHCP pool. We'll we'll just stick with ASDM um, for this. So client address pools here. Select. We'll add a new one. Let's give it. Um, <coughs> We'll call it VPN pool and then starting IP address 192.168.11.1. Ending IP address is 192.168.11.50. And our subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. So we'll assign that, press OK on that. So that's our pull done. Um, the tunnel must secure traffic only for server one and server two. So what this is saying is for our split tunnel. Um, so let's just OK out of that and go to our group policy. So for our, when it lets me click on it. So for our split tunnel, we're still tunneling. Yeah, so DNS is still being tunneled. This time we're not going to tunnel all networks. We're going to tunnel. Let's tunnel networks listed below. And the network list, let's manage a network list. Call this one service tunnel. Uh, and we're going to permit no address there for that one. add one uh, we need the server IP address so server 1 is here server 2 is there so 
and then the other is one hundred and one ten two three so now we specified those to be tunneled VPN must be authenticated by ICE, so we need to change the authentication method to use ICE. Uh, so if we go back up to our, in fact, let's go down to AAA server groups. We'll add a new one. We'll call this one <coughs> ICE to use radius. And we'll press OK on that one. And then we need to add a server. So where's our ice node? It's here. So let's see. Uh, let's get up the resources. Uh, and then let's find I, so it's 150, wait a minute, is that the 1? So, what's this saying? Does that mean it's just got a connection to ice? Let's go with. I'm not logged into ice, so maybe we should quickly log into ice on the management system so let's just minimize let's cancel that a minute and we'll come back to that uh, let's go to uh, ice let's just see if it's a standalone or it's distributed go to uh, administration deployment system deployment yeah looks like we've got a standalone node here yeah standalone node 15171 so we'll add this one um, 1517 so let's add this one in here If it's gonna let me, so uh, give me a second there. So one fifty one seven. One fifty one seven one one one. And let's use, uh, we'll use the new pass 1812 and 1813. You can hear my son there in the uh, background, maybe. It's the weekend, so uh, he's wanting to see his daddy. Um, let's, uh, let's just make sure that the interface is correct. We'll give it a secret key and then we'll specify that in in uh, in ice as well I'll just apply all them settings that we've done so far uh, let's go back to ice and then we will 
go to network devices and then we're going to add this ASA in here now uh, so we'll call this one ASA and then we'll enable uh, radius shared secret needs to be the same as the one that we specified on the ASA and uh, let's leave it like uh, no let's give it the IP address obviously and then I forgot that um, so the IP address in which it's going to be coming from is DMZ1 so if I do show uh, in fact before I do do that let me just do uh, yeah interface is DMZ the one so ten one ten eleven. Ten one ten eleven. Let's go ahead and save that now. <coughs> uh, and we won't have a policy set configured, I don't think. So we've got a default one. Uh, what's the default one doing? Because we're using ICE for the authentication, we're going to need a user. Does that task list say that we need to use Active Directory? Let's have a look. Just must be authenticated by ICE. The authentication condition must be based on the NAS port type. So we need to specify an authentication. And the authorization policy must be Active Directory user group. So we do need to use Active Directory. So authentication condition so let's add a new one here let's call this uh, VPN and we use, must use a uh, NAS port type so let's go to attributes And then let's go to well, la, la, la. Edit there. Uh, so it's NAS port type. Oh, yeah, it's going to be. We could use one of part type actually but what we can do given time is let's just go with virtual for now and then um, let's save that because I need to check and see whether Active Directory is already joined or not um, so if we go to external identity sources yeah so we've got Active Directory already joined um, are we on the directory server there I think I know the uh, credentials are there let's 
get the credentials then for this one. Uh, administrator. Go and um, we need to go to users and computers. Let's add a uh, let's add a user. Call this user Kelvin. Kelvin. Give it a password. Let's not change it. Alright, so we've got a user here. Um, member of the main users, let's just keep it as that in the interest of time. Um, so let's go back to ICE, let's go back to our policy sets. Let's go to authorization and then let's add a VPN off red. And does it give us any, it just says it must be authorization condition must be based on the active directory user group. That's fine. So we can do that now. Let's go to that and we'll go to Find our server. Uh, my group, uh, internal, external group. Can't remember what the um. I can't remember what the, uh, tell you what, let me duplicate this because I can't remember what the uh, server were called. Cisco AD. There is external group domain users. Let's use that. That's the one that's been mapped anyway. Um, so that should be, and we'll just permit access. Let's save that. Okay, we'll go to live logs. And I think everything else should be done. Let me just double check my connection profile. Uh, this was for Ike V2, so we need to enable Ike V2. Use the device certificate, and we'll just do. Um, we'll do. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's add a. Let's just create a self-signed one. Uh, finish that. Uh, let's export it. Let's just export it to desktop. Okay. Finish. Uh, let's add in. Uh, we can select that one now. 
Okay, so now let's apply that and then I don't think I'm missing out. Let's just download this while we're here. Save. Uh, save it to downloads. And then we need to install any connect. Oops, not finished yet. Still got the part file there. <coughs> Come on, trying to rush because of time. <sighs> Look how slow it is. No. Twenty-four minutes, and we've got nine minutes left. So I don't think it's going to deploy in time, and I don't think the remote worker has the AnyConnect client already. Nope, we don't. So that's probably one observation. Actually, is that. Um, maybe downloads could be quicker I mean if you've got a four hour window yes you only need to download it once but you know you kinda really gonna do it when you get to it so maybe downloads could be quicker but that's just yeah that's that's my feedback there <clears throat> but essentially that should um, that should work now because we've got all the requirements in place uh, for task free um, we just need the any connect client and then we should be able to should be able to test that so I don't think we're going to be, be able to do it in eight, eight minutes just less than eight minutes coming up so um, I think I'll leave that there I think <clears throat> just to kind of give you some feedback I think the environment is really useful really handy um, I think if you're going to spend $50 on this then make sure you do set the time aside the four hours aside to really focus on this I think before you do schedule any time it's worth um, at least knowing some of the um, the commands or some of the requirements uh, from the blueprint so that you can kind of really make use of the time as opposed to spending time searching on the Cisco documentation for the configuration um, but nevertheless it is a learning environment so that's what it's for um, th like I say the reason I recommend that is so that you can really get that four hour use um, out of your time um, I think it's really useful given uh, the 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 guidelines uh, that say that it's similar to the uh, lab environment uh, that you will encounter. So I think it's really worth um, you know remembering these uh, topologies or taking a screenshot or whatever of the topologies uh, so that you can kind of just familiarise yourself with the environment and kind of what what's going on where. Um, but yeah, I think overall my feedback is um, I think it's a really good environment. I think it's something that Cisco should have done a long time ago actually and should have started delivering a long time ago, uh, especially for those that don't have access to um, the technology or a lab environment to, to practice on as well. Um, I think the layout's pretty good. Um, I think the, the usability here to be able to flick between different um, consoles and environments is really good um, and I think yeah overall <clears throat> my feedback is is positive of this so I give it a thumbs up and I do recommend it and I think if you are looking at doing your CCIE security uh, lab exam anytime soon or in the future then this is something that you do need to check out and make use of as well if you've used it already and you recently either passed the CCIE security exam let me know kind of what you thought about um, about this did you find it useful for the for the real exam if you've 
already passed the CCI security ex exam recently um, and you're watching this do let me know again what you think do, do you see kind of some comparisons there um, as well and also for those that are you know looking at using this or maybe have used it once or twice already let me know what your thoughts are let me know if you enjoyed it as well